Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Tanyuan Academy series, and this is English Nerd. So several months ago, I did a literary terms starter pack. It might have been last year. I think it was, but who even knows? Um, so I'm going to link that down below, but I decided to add on to that series, essentially, with uh, degrees of difficulty. And so this is kind of a medium, uh, once you've mastered those first initial literary terms, then you can move on to the, these, which are a little bit more advanced, a little bit uh, more, yeah, a little bit more advanced. We'll just leave it at that. So here are the 10 next literary terms. Number one is a conceit. A conceit is essentially a metaphor, but it's established for a longer amount of time. So if you read um, some of the metaphysical poets, for example, um, the, the British poets like John Donne or Andrew Marvell, they tend to have a metaphor and then they develop it over the course of several lines. And so that would be an example of a conceit. Next, uh, a sejura. Sejura, it's spelled kind of unusually there. A sejura is just a break in a line of verse. So if you read something like Beowulf, there's literally going to be a space in between one half of the line and the next, but that's extraordinarily rare. Um, more often, a sejura is going to look like a comma or a period or a dash or something in the middle of a line of verse that makes you pause. The effect of sejuras can can uh, control the pace of how quickly you read the poem. It can create a breathless effect. It can create a more natural speaking kind of cadence to it rather than stopping at the end of the lines. And so a sejura can be a useful tool in talking about poetry. Next, and this is related uh, in, at least I think so, in jammed lines versus in stopped lines. In jammed lines are when a line of poetry, a line of verse, continues on to the next one with no punctuation at the end of the line. So you're not meant to have this big lengthy pause at the end. An end stopped line, on the other hand, has a bit of punctuation at the end. So a period, a dash, a semicolon, a comma, something that makes you take a breath at the end of the line. So if you have a poem that has a lot of end stopped lines, it can sound more sing-songy. It can really emphasize the rhyme if there's rhyme in the poem. An N jammed line can make the poem reading go faster. It can, um, much like Sejura's can at times, make it sound more like a natural cadence of speaking if you just continue on through that line. So um, that's a two for one. Next, and this is one that I did a video about all on its own a, a couple weeks ago. Um, onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is when a word sounds like what it means. So these are sound effect words, essentially. This is bang, squelch, pop, you know, those kinds of words. And if you want to know more about onomatopoeia and the different kind of nuances and ways that that can look, I will link the video down below. Next, we have paradox. A paradox is when you have two contradictory ideas juxtaposed against one another that actually form a deeper truth. They only appear to contradict one another. So a very classic um, religious example would be God is three in one. Apparently these are contradictory ideas, but there is a sort of deeper truth to it. Another good example from literature would be from A Tale of Two Cities. The first line says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now you can separate that out and say, well, the wealthy in France had the best of times, and then the poor in France had the worst of times. But I would argue that by the time we get to the end of A Tale of Two Cities, and I'm not one to spoil, uh, but there's, there's an event that happens that could be considered both simultaneously the best and worst of times. And that's another great example of a paradox. These are everywhere in great literature, particularly poetry, but as you saw with my example, it can be a prose as well. Next, we have a motif. A motif is commonly confused with theme and, and uh, some other terms, it seems to me, but a motif is essentially just an image 
or an idea or a feature that is repeated throughout a work. So you could have a, 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 well, let me give you an example from music. Music has this same term, a motif, a light motif, for example, is a, a melody or a musical feature that is repeated throughout the, the piece. A motif in terms of literature can be uh, a motif of, you know, considering death, like uh, I'm just I'm teaching Hamlet, so it's kind of on the brain. Uh, there can also be a motif uh, plants come up all the time, just in various important ways. Uh, there can be a motif of, uh, oh gosh, I'm having difficulty thinking of another, but you get the idea. It's an image, it's an idea, it's a feature that is prominently repeated throughout a work. It's different from theme in that theme is a big idea around which the story centers. It's a big idea that the story considers throughout the, the, the length of it. A motif can, and usually does, support the theme, kind of direct you to the theme, but it is not itself a theme. If you're interested in, in more information about that, you can always ask down below. Okay, next I have apostrophe. Apostrophe, of course, you know what the um, punctuation apostrophe is, but that's not what I'm referring to here. The literary term apostrophe is a direct address to something inanimate or more often absent. So sometimes this is taught as, as a line that begins, oh, something, oh, love, oh, hope, you know, these, these things that are, that are not animate uh, things, right? These ideas. Ode on a Grecian urn begins, uh, thou, thou still unravished bride of quietness. He's addressing the urn, which of course is not able to address him back. In Julius Caesar, when Brutus looks at the body of, of Julius Caesar and begins to address him, that could also be considered apostrophe because Julius Caesar essentially is not really there or able to respond. But this can look in, in many different ways. In Canterbury Tales, in the Nun's Priest Tale, there's this part that goes, Oh, Ganelon, oh, Judas, oh, Sinon, how could this, how could this tre tre you know, treachery be? And all of those would be apostrophes because all those famous traitors don't show up in the actual story itself. Um, next, I have a pun, which is uh, just a play on words, essentially. So, like I said, I have Hamlet on the brain because I usually have Hamlet on the brain. And when Hamlet speaks to the gravedigger, they pun on the word lie, the, the two main senses of the word lie. So to tell a lie, uh, an untruth, versus to lie down. And so Hamlet's asking whose grave it is, and the guy says, it's mine, even though I don't lie in it. And Hamlet says, you are lying in it if you say it's yours. So that would be a, a pun. Of course, those can get much more elaborate as Facebook has taught us. <laughs> Next, we have anaphora. Anaphora is a type of repetition. You'll find that, that English literary terms are kind of like nesting dolls. We have these, these overall umbrella terms, things like metaphor and juxtaposition and repetition. And then beneath those, we have more specific examples or types of those. And so anaphora is a type of repetition. It's the re it's repeated word or phrase at the beginning of successive clauses. And so, for example, um, A Tale of Two Cities is what I'm teaching next, so that's on the brain. There's a passage in chapter five of book one where the, it's the wine shop chapter and we're introduced to the poverty in France and Dickens writes about it saying hunger pushed its way out of windows hunger hung on the laundry lines hunger this hunger that hunger this hunger that and hunger is the is the anaphora there we have an example of that repetition at the beginning of successive clauses so that would be an, uh, a good a good example although not the only one surely and then last but not least for today, euphemism. A euphemism is a, is a milder term for something that is considered too harsh or blunt. And so um, although there can be euphemisms for a wide variety of different things, uh, the most common uh, euphemisms are for sex or death. Those two terms are considered too blunt in a lot of different 
circumstances and so you'll say something like sleep together or pass away or kick the bucket or something like that but it can be like I said for more things than just those two it can be something like uh, yes uh, they're big boned I know that sounds terrible but uh, that's that's another euphemism right so that is our literary term starter pack part two Look for the next one before the AP literature exam in May. Uh, I'm going to take it up even one more notch and give you some really advanced terms that I hope will be elucidated through these videos. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, put those down below. Don't forget to like this video if you like it and subscribe with notifications. You see the bell there if you want more English nerdy goodness. Until next Monday, bye.